he was a, a man preaching about a religion? Uh, Jesus is an object of Christianity used to rally the masses and they, they rally the masses in order to control. I believe he's, he's the son of God and I believe he's the one true God. Um, I'm, I'm LDS and the LDS people believe that God the Father and Jesus Christ are separate but according to the Book of Mormon and the Bible I don't believe that. I believe in the Trinity. Um, you know, I'm not really sure who Jesus was. I think Jesus was probably just a, yeah, another person that they decided to write some epic dialogue about, such as Beowulf or what you have you not. Um, I don't really see any difference between him and other religious leaders. Somehow he got the gold crown, whereas other people didn't. Oh, he was a smart man, uh, a philosopher, but he was just a man. You know, he, he, he turned everything around. Oh, he had a lot of good thoughts. I think he was a historical figure that, um, well, I'm willing to accept him as the Son of God. I don't really think I uh, have too much to comment on that. I was raised Mormon and I've kind of given up on organized religion. I think Jesus is more of an embodiment than maybe an actual person. That's that's how I always saw Jesus. So okay. just kind of kind of an example, maybe um, the embodiment of love and forgiveness. But I think as far as an actual person, I don't I don't take him too seriously. Uh, well my name is Daniel. I belong to the Colombian congregation. I'm a Jewish man. And according to our, our, our knowledge, Jesus was a spiritual teacher. He, I think that he belonged to the Essence uh, group, a uh, mystical uh, group of people at that time, and um, that's basically all I know about him. My opinion is just that he was obviously a man of great influence, but I think a lot of the things that he was doing, everybody can do, just through your subconscious. Well, he almost certainly was a historical figure. I don't think there's anybody who, who would dispute that. Um, whether he was God or not, or the Son of God, I would find that, I find it very difficult to believe myself. are trying to speak to about a relationship with Jesus and what he can do in their hearts and in their life. If you're interested in tapping into Micah's talents, uh, which include filmmaking and computer and paper graphic design and website hosting, go to www.micahbailey.com. It's there on your screen, www.micahbailey.com, and uh, go from there. I was just reminded that also at Heart in the Church, we have a Actually, the best part of Heart in the Church is the Q&A when you get to stand up and ask questions and, and I get to try to respond and uh, often uh, it works out to be a fun event. So last week, before we get to our message, last week we stirred up or I stirred up a bit of a storm for two things. One of them was my daughter Mallory, who uh, if you saw last week, she gave kind of her speech on uh, what she thought about religion. And, uh, and then I also made a comment about a polygamist that was living in South America and came to know the Lord and another pastor's um, advice to him on a radio show of should he leave his polygamous relationship or stay with the wives and children that he produced. So let me make a comment about Mallory's comment. She said that Christianity, she believed a religion was a crutch. And I want you to know that I completely agree with that. I believe that Christianity is a crutch. And this comment is really particularly directed at people who have uh, spoke to me over the week, but also at my daughter Delaney, who listened to that and said, yeah, that makes sense to me. Does, it is a crutch, isn't it? And um, I, I, I don't think it's so much uh, that it's uh, not or is a crutch. I think the problem is in perspective. And so I want to talk about that just for a second. Crutches are very important to us in this life. Um, if you break an ankle, 
and you want to get around and be mobile, you're going to need a crutch. Um, insulin is certainly a crutch for a diabetic and uh, the crutch keeps this person alive. We have environmental crutches. I happen to be addicted to oxygen and I'm also addicted to water and uh, food, if you can believe it, are part of my crutches. And so we have an assortment of crutches that we rely on to keep us living and thriving. And when it comes to um, uh, our um, spiritual walk, I thank God that he provided this world with a true spiritual crutch. Because when you have spiritual devastation in your life, he is there just like insulin is for the diabetic, just like oxygen is for each of us to help us along. The perspective problem is when people uh, take on the Nietzschean, Ubermensch, Superman mentality, Invictus, I don't need anything and I don't need a crutch. That's the problem of perspective because where they will say they don't need any type of spiritual cr crutch, they readily embrace the other crutches that God has given them. And uh, so in a sense, I agree with Mallory. Yes, Christianity is a crutch. The, the ideal, though, is for people to come to realize that that crutch is probably even more necessary, not probably, even more necessary than oxygen or water or insulin. So there's my comments on the uh, crutch. Uh, this is going to be sound radical, but I would rather be uh, a drug-addicted believer in Jesus than a strong Ubermensch man, Superman that Nietzsche, that Nietzsche described and not have him in my life at all. So uh, there's the comment on that. Now the polygamy ordeal. Dear Lord in heaven, we, I have got more emails from women in the state of Utah mad at me because I agree with Chuck Smith who said the man who had already established marriages with these three women and children and a family in South America where polygamy is legal, I said he should, Chuck Smith said he should stay with them. And it's not an ideal situation. Uh, it's kind of ugly, but we have, I mean, this is a stack of the polygamy emails on and on and on and on, calling me antinomian, which is another way of saying I'm lawless, that I don't believe in the Bible, that it's against God's will and ways. And I just have to say that, uh, that it's not true. Um, I don't believe that uh, polygamy is a good thing ever. I don't believe that anybody should start practicing polygamy. I don't believe that a Christian should say, I'm going to start, start it. And I stand against it so much when it's in the LDS history. But there are circumstances, messy circumstances in this life that happen that we can't do anything about. And I use this example for imagine that a transsexual male who became a woman went to Switzerland and had the parts removed and then became a Christian and decided that he loved the Lord. I mean, you can't reverse that operation. So, you know, there's just things that happen in this messy fallen world that aren't picturesque and aren't perfect. But, you know, woe be to any of us to point the finger and say, you are a sinner and you need to do this, change this right now. The grace stepped in and covers this stuff. It doesn't mean you use licentiousness. It means we have liberty in Christ when there's things, when situations that exist that we can't do anything about. I side with that stance because I believe that it stands with the family and if the wives want to stay in that and the children are happy and the husband is a good guy, then it's better than breaking them all up and sending them off in different places. But we just have to deal with it and go on. Please, no more emails. All right, let's have a word of prayer before we get into our topic. Lord, we thank you uh, for everything that is going on in this ministry and for you reaching out and touching people, Lord. We pray for our studio audience. We pray for our audience out there uh, uh, listening and watching on TV. We pray for those who are working here in the studio, volunteering their time. And help me that I'll say the things that you want me to say. In Jesus' name, amen. So Fanny Alger, who was a maid in the home of Joseph and Emma Smith in Kirtland, Ohio, and who was described as nice and beautiful, and who Joseph loved, those are two quotes, became his first polygamous wife. She was in her mid-teens. Not too many months later, a secret, uh, a rumor kind of came up in Kirtland, Ohio, that there was a secret marriage, and these rumors started to spread. Joseph Smith left town uh, for a trip to Michigan, and while he was gone, an article of marriage was presented and accepted by the saints. It denied the practice of polygamy. Joseph was gone. 
He escaped all, all the heat that was going on in an article of marriage that said polygamy is wrong. Uh, Oliver Cowdery got piously curious into what was being said about Joseph Smith and decided to do some checking into the rumors about Joseph's relationship to young Fanny Alger. Even to the point it is said that he and a few others gathered around here in the Kirtland Temple and tried to get her to confess that they had a relationship. Because of his delving, Oliver Cowdery, scribe to the Book of Mormon and cousin of Joseph Smith, was excommunicated for, quote, seeking to destroy the character of the prophet Joseph Smith by falsely insinuating that he was guilty of adultery, An end quote. Smith would de deny adultery over and over again because to him it wasn't. It was a marriage authorized by God with a ceremony that he dictated to Levi Hancock, who repeated it as, fam as Fanny and the prophet stood there before him. A marriage uh, that was not very much appreciated, however, by his wife, Emma. Anne Eliza Webb Young, a woman who divorced Brigham Young, wrote a story, and so did her father, and it's been substantiated in other accounts, that in the middle of the night, Emma Smith, who loved Fanny Alger as her own daughter for months before, took her and threw her out into the open air uh, to wander off to wherever. It was almost like the same thing that happened with uh, Sariah and Haggai in the old uh, Sarah and Hag uh, Haggai in the Old Testament. I mean, all of a sudden, Emma loves uh, Fanny to death, and then all of a sudden, she tosses her out of the house and never invites her to return. Though wed to Smith around 1833, Fanny Alger left the self-proclaimed prophet and returned to monogamy in 1836 by marrying Mr. Solomon Custer. She also left Mormonism for good. We know Fanny went on to raise a family of nine children, three or four of which who died. And uh, the death of children is a common thread that most polygamous wives of Joseph Smith experience. And you'll learn that as we go on to talk about it. After Joseph Smith's death, Fanny was questioned by one of her brothers about her relationship to the dead prophet, to which she replied, and this is the last thing we know of her, quote, that is all a matter of my own and I have nothing to communicate, end quote. And though her parents and the rest of the Alger family moved on to Nauvoo, Illinois, and then to Utah, nothing more is known of family except she was once a teen home a housemaid of the family, that Joseph married her, Emma kicked her out into the night, and she abandoned Mormonism for good. As far as we know, Joseph would not receive another wife unto himself until 1838. Her name was Lucinda Pendleton. Lucinda was described as short, with light hair, bright blue eyes, and pleasing, end quote. When she was 18 years old, she was married to a man named William Morgan, who was an anti-Mason writer. He was 45. In 1824, five years later, she bore their first child. Morgan, her husband, wrote an anti-Mormon, anti-Mason book called, quote, Illustrations of Masonry by one of the fraternity who has devoted 30 years to the subject. That's the name of the book, long title. For writing this book, some Masons kidnapped Morgan and killed him. This murder, the event itself, and the subsequent uh, uh, attempts to hide the murder by the Masons caused a mass upheaval and revulsion against Masonry in the United States. Up till that time, Masonry was very strong in the eastern U.S. But when they killed Morgan because he was going to reveal their secrets in this book, and then they tried to cover it up through their political power, the U.S. turned on him. The trial was held for Morgan's murder uh, in 1827, right when Joseph Smith was compiling the Book of Mormon. As a side note, it seems that the headline cries in the newspapers of secret combinations talking about Morgan's murder by the Masons, that's a lot of M's, um, somehow made their way as a theme into the Book of Mormon at the same time. It's very, very interesting. Anyway, four years later, after Morgan's disappearance at the hand of the Masons, Lucinda, uh, his wife, married her downstairs neighbor, a man by the name of Harris. She was 29, he was 50. Three years later, in 1834, she and Harris were baptized by Oliver Pratt. Uh, Orson Pratt, excuse me. By 1838, Harris was on a high council in far west Missouri. As you recall, Mormonism was split at this time between Ohio and Missouri. 
And in 1838, Joseph Smith and his wife Emma made a move to Missouri. When he and Emma arrived, Harris, Lucinda's new husband, was assigned to meet them. Of their accommodations, Joseph Smith himself wrote, quote, We were immediately received under the hospitable roof of George W. Harris, who treated us with all kindness possible. Here we refreshed ourselves with much satisfaction after our long and tedious journey. The Smiths stayed at the Harris's house for some two months before moving to their own place. LDS author Todd Compton, an expert in this field, writes, quote, There is no firm date for Smith's marriage to Lucinda, but these two months are a good possibility. He often married women while he was living in the same house with them. So just so you understand, Harris and his new bride opened their home for the Smiths to stay while they could transition into their new home in Missouri, and Smith in the interim probably married his wife. Okay? Harris, the man, was a faithful Latter-day Saint. He was dedicated and devoted and probably was willing to even give up his wife Lucinda to be sealed to the prophet Joseph Smith for time and all eternity, even though Lucinda was married uh, polygamously to Smith in 1838, she continued to live with Harris through the remainder of her marriage. This was the case with all the married women who were sealed to Smith. He would marry women who were sealed to him, but he would not live with them. Harris continued to be promoted through the ranks of the church, and he, he offered very good service in his, uh, in his activity as a Mormon. He became a member of the legendary Danites, which we'll discuss later, and Joseph wrote a letter that he had hand-selected a property right across the street from him in Nauvoo for the Harrises to live. While alive, Smith enjoyed arranging marriages for his followers, including that of Lucinda's 16-year-old daughter to other people. When Harris was sent out on a mission and gone preaching Mormonism for a full year in 1840, Willard Richards, a member of the church, recorded that he and Joseph dined with Lucinda, his polygamous wife, and his dead brother's wife, Agnes Colberth, who would also become one of Joseph Smith's wife at her home. So they sent, they sent Harris out on a mission, this faithful saint. Joseph not only married her when they took him in to stay there, but later on when he was on his mission, Joseph had dinner with her at the home of another Latter-day Saint polygamist. After Joseph Smith was martyred, Lucinda was sealed to him in Nauvoo posthumously with her earthly husband standing in his proxy for the dead husband. It's amazing. It would be like Gordon B. Hinckley taking my wife as one of his wives and Gordon B. Hinckley passing away and me going to the temple and standing in as Gordon B. Hinckley as proxy so my wife could be sealed to him for eternity again. That's the equivalent to it. All right. It's interesting also to know that when the saints went to Nauvoo, Illinois, that all marriages were called null. They were all void, every marriage. And it gave people a chance then to decide if they wanted to continue to be married to the person they were with or if they wanted to choose to go a, another route. I'm sure this opened up the door for more uh, people to be sealed to other active uh, men of the church. After 20 years of marriage, Her uh, uh, to Harris, Lucinda left him. After Joseph Smith died, Lucinda left Harris. He remained a devout Latter-day Saint, but because he believed Missouri was soon to be the place where Jesus returned to, he said, I'm not going to Utah. Years later, after he had passed on, Brigham Young spoke here in Salt Lake City in 1860 and said, quote, Harris has gone to the spirit world and where his circuit will be, I neither know nor care. What it says is this man, he, he joined the church. He gave his wife to polygamy to Joseph Smith. He served faithfully. He went on a mission. And when he said, I don't want to go to Utah because there's a prophecy that Jesus is going to return to Missouri, Brigham Young denounced his, uh, uh, his spirituality to here in Utah through its talk and said he doesn't even care where he went after he died. All this because he chose to think for himself. Lucinda not only left her devoted husband, but Mormonism too. She joined the Catholic Sisters of Charity in a hospital in Tennessee and was the only plural wife of Smith to turn east and play some role in the coming Civil War, which she probably thought was a picnic compared to being married to three different husbands, Smith included. We're going to go to the phones, 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. 
We'd like to have first time callers only if possible. And uh, while we're waiting, I was gonna read some emails, but we have somebody, Gary from Dallas, Texas, a first time caller on line one. Gary, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hey, Sean, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. I've downloaded and watched almost all of your shows over the past few months and I've enjoyed all of them. Thanks. So thanks for sharing the true gospel on TV. You're welcome. Um, my, my question is, assuming that the official LDS leaders know the problems with the Book of Mormon and other aspects of the religion, do you think that they resolve to themselves that Mormonism is still better than other religions, or might they just have deceptive motives? Yeah, it's, you know, that's it's such a good question. Um, and it's just my personal belief, but I think that there are some who uh, uh, are being deceptive, and I think there are some who understand the Book of Mormon and its problems and believe it's still the best thing that's out there when it comes to religions. And then I think there are some who just categorically believe the Book of Mormon uh, through and through, don't care about anything, and they think it is the true church. So I think there's probably several groups in that hierarchy of leadership, and they uh, just don't come to a common consensus because they're probably afraid to share their true feelings. I see. Does that help? Yeah. Well, thank you. Hey, thanks for the call. Yeah. All right, see you later. Bye-bye. We're going to Jason in Salt Lake City on line two. Jason, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hey, sorry about that. Hey, um, I know you said you want first-time callers, but I've called a couple of times. I just want to tell you how good you're doing because me and you are a lot alike. Finally, we get somebody that tells it like it is, that tells the truth. Well, you know, awesome. You know, big, giant Omega Church, you know, dancing around. Oh, look, I can talk 50 different tongues and give me money, money, money. I mean, you, t you don't twist anything. You tell the truth. That's, what, that's what's great. I love it. Okay. The only thing is, um, we would, if I was running your show, I'd get a lot of crap, too, because um, I've got really long hair, and people would be calling me up, oh, you need to cut that hair, like how they tell you to cut your beard. Yeah. And number, and another thing really quick, um, this, cane, this cane thing. Um, talk to people from the Middle East, from Iraq. There's all kinds of them. You know what they say? They'll tell you that they believe his hands were turned white. Really? Yeah, they believe that. Wow. It, and think about it. It sounds like the elliptic old by what God would do. I mean, you know, uh, man uh, sins with his hands. Why not curse his hands? It sounds like the old God of the Testament. Well, he taught me something new there. I've never heard that before. Very interesting. So when Cain killed his... In the, middle, in the Middle East, like Israel, yeah. talk to people. I mean, really get into deep, deep what they believe. It's totally different from... I mean, it'll shock you. You'll be like, I could tell you hundreds of things right now. And then you can turn around and go ask these people, and you'll be like, wow. I mean, it's just amazing. Huh. And think about it. If, if you know, I don't believe Cain turned black, because where did the Asians come from? Where did the Asians come from? When Jesus was teaching his ministry at the same time, the, uh, over in China, they had the samurais running around. When Jesus was going around Israel teaching, up in the, you know, it just, it's retarded. It's insane, man. Hey, I really appreciate your comments. All righty, thank you. Thanks for calling. Bye-bye. Uh -huh, Bye-bye. We're going to Kevin in Salt Lake City on line three. Kevin, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hello, Sean. Hello, Kevin. Sean, I uh, had some comments on polygamy. Uh, I couldn't help but uh, remember, recall, uh, in last week's program. Yes. When you uh, told that, oh, I lost the thought. When you uh, said that it, it irritated you that, you know, the Mormons, uh, Believe, didn't believe in polygamy. Well, um, it's kind of funny that the Mormons are um, denying polygamy, but they are polygamous, and Brigham Young is probably the most famous polygamist in the history of America. And I know how the Mormons set out on Warren Jeffs, who is, you know, a polygamous prophet. Right. Yet they have a statue of Brigham Young right on... Uh, what street would that be? State or Maine? It's South Maine. And the, you know, of course, the rear end to the temple and the hand to the bank. Right. And uh, when the Mormons say that polygamy uh, existed in the Bible, the polygamy that existed in the Bible was among Jews. As far as Christians go, I don't know of any Christians that were polygamous. In fact, most of the Christians in the Bible were not even married. A lot of the apostles, 
the angels, Jesus, and God himself are not married. Right. So when they propose the notion that you have to be married uh, multiple times to go to the celestial kingdom, what basis in right. Christianity does that have? You know, that's, that's total blasphemy that you have to have multiple wives to be saved. Right. Well, excellent points, man. I really appreciate it. And, Sean, it doesn't surprise me that on Temple Square you'll see the Star of David and you'll see Jewish icons, but you'll have to search pretty far to see a Christian cross. Yes, you will. Great points, my friend. Thank you, Kevin. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, listen, I want to make a few points. One, the uh, LDS believe that they are the restored church, being the restored church, everything from Adam till uh, the end of the, uh, or the, where the church was restored needs to be restored, and polygamy, they believe, was one of those things. Whether you were Jewish or not doesn't matter to them. Secondly, the Jews were never commanded uh, to practice polygamy. It was always the idea of men, and it did nothing but hurt them, and there's never an instance in the Bible where polygamy was a good thing. And uh, finally, I have an email really quick I want to read, and it's from uh, Dave, who uh, talked to me, and he said, From the book, The Mysteries of Godliness, The History of Mormon Temple Worship by David John Brueger, on, Wil on Wilford Woodruff's 70th birthday in St. George Temple, with 154 performing proxy endowments for women who had been there and were being sealed to him. This is a quote from Wilford Woodruff. I'm reading it from this email. I can't tell you it's verified. I'll check it out, but it says, quote, I arrived at the temple of the Lord in the St. George, Washington County at 8 a.m. in the morning, and I was surrounded by 154 virgins, maiden daughters and mothers in Zion from the age of 14 to the aged mother leaning on her staff. And it talks about him being sealed to all 154 of those women in St. George in his life. Very interesting stuff. Okay, let's go to Larry in Salt Lake City. Uh, first time caller. Larry, you're on Heart of the Matter. Uh, I, I wanted to call you and let you know you, you had a discussion one time. They were talking about the children of mixed religion. It's been, oh, two or three months ago. But, okay. Uh, the end result was they decided most of them became atheists. You know what? We're out there. <laughs> yeah. A lot of us did turn into that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you see that all through the state of Utah. I was raised half Mormon and half Church of Christ, and between the two of them, boy, I'm so confused, it just doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's a really good point. For those listeners and viewers who are wondering, you know, is it okay to get married to somebody who's not of your faith? I mean, it's not good advice. It just isn't. So uh, come to know the Lord, marry a good Christian, and your family and children will be uh, far less upset. Actually, I ended up marrying a Jehovah's Witness. Well, perfect. And did you have Catholic children? I mean, what's going on? Uh, we ended up with one Mormon child. Wow, that's a strange mix. It's yeah. almost like breeding love. Well, anyway, it, it, excellent yeah. comments, man. Thank you so much. All righty. Have a good night. All right. See you later. You know, I should have told him. I, I failed there that there is a hope in, in the Lord in a relationship with him. So if you've turned your TV back up, uh, Please know and uh, come to Lord's Word or go to any other church that's a good Bible teaching church in Utah. And you can find out that through the mess of Mormonism and all that religion, there is someone you can establish a relationship with that will change your life. We're going to Jim in Layton. Jim, you're on Heart of the Matter. Okay, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. I've got a question for you. Yes, sir. About uh, In Luke 20, there's a story about um, a lady that uh, her husband dies and she marries the brothers. And die, they die one after another. Right. And they ask him, uh, who are you going to be with in heaven? Yeah. Jesus says, there is no marriage in heaven. Right. Do I, do I take that to mean that uh, after you die, you're kind of much on your own and you're not really sealed to anybody? Well, that's the way uh, the Christians take it. That's the way I take it. And uh, the way the LDS take it, maybe you know, is that they believe that you have to be married here and sealed here, that in, in heaven there's not going to be any ceremonies. But uh, I think that God is uh, going to have something better for us than marriage. I know a lot of people who don't want to be married and are very good Christians in heaven. They're just biding their time now. So... Uh, you know, I don't know if marriage is the ultimate. I think it's an earthly institution that does help propagate families, and, and you have the male and female perspective bringing up children. But God, he's, he, I'm sure he's going to have us all know each other. It's not biblical. We don't know. But maybe that is how we live by faith. 
Maybe it's important for us to trust God with our spouses and our children and know he's going to handle us better than anybody else. Okay, great. Thanks very much. And I was at Lord's work this weekend, and I thought it was great. Oh, thanks for coming. Okay, and, talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We're going to Nevin from Roy on line three. Nevin, is that English? You're on Heart of the Matter. Yes. How you doing? How you doing? I'm doing well. That rain's coming down. <laughs> Hey, I wondered why the White Horse Prophecy hasn't come up in the Romney campaign. You know, I, I think the White Horse Prophecy, uh, from what I've read, is not a prophecy, but a myth in Mormonism. And it's been taught as though it were prophecy and bannered about in um, priesthood meetings forever. Uh -huh. But I don't think it was ever really an official prophecy. And before you speak again, let me tell the audience, the White Horse Prophecy is this belief that the uh, U.S. Constitution is going to hang by a thread. That's the quote they use. And that the Mormon elders, the church, are going to step in and save it. Right. And so that has always been taught in priesthood meetings, always been talked about. But now they're saying, and I believe it's probably true, that it's not a doctrine. It was never written in any canon or anything else said by a prophet under the Spirit of God or whatever. You know if it's in the Journal of Discourses or not? You know, I don't even think it's in the Journal of Discourses. And I don't believe it was a church leader who said it. I believe it was somebody else who, who said, you know, there's going to come a time when this Constitution is going to hang by a thread and the, and the LDS church is going to step in and save it. And people just kind of started spouting that and saying it. And the thing that's irritating is, you know, they have never stepped out and said it wasn't doctrine until now that they've got some Mormon running for the uh, U.S. presidency. And now they're saying, no, we've never said that. We never said that because they know they'll lose votes if that was a doctrine. Uh, so uh, I was under the impression Joseph Smith said it. No, I, I don't. I'm pretty 99 percent sure Joseph Smith didn't say it. Yeah. But if anyone can find it, please call in, email me, whatever it is, and let's get that cleared up. OK, thank you. Hey, thanks for the call. Hey, bye. Bye bye. Lisa in Murray, first time caller. Lisa, you're on Heart of the Matter. Yes, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? I'm great. Hey, I had just a quick question. There's a, a scripture that comes to mind that talks about when we die that we're not given to marriage. You might recall what that is. I don't, but I remember it. How do Mormons get around that? It talks about it in the Bible. Um, Was that the same question that we just had? Our scholars behind the desk say yes, that's a question we just had. Uh, but what it is, Lisa, is... Latter-day Saints don't believe that there is any marriage in heaven, meaning there's not a pastor or a bishop up there uh -huh. performing the marriages. So therefore, you have to use this time, this probationary period that you're on earth, to be married to somebody here. So they believe that if you get married here by the proper priesthood authority, you will be sealed, married in heaven to that person. They just don't believe that once uh, you're up there, you'll be married again. Okay. Which is really interesting because there's another doctrine that floats around that says, you know, these, these uh, good women who have terrible reprobate husbands and they stay faithful to the church will become the wives of another faithful man there. Yeah. So, so, you know, they kind of hit it both ways, which is typical. Right. But, yeah, both of those things float around. Okay, well, I appreciate your answering my question. All right, thanks for calling. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, bye. We're going to Andrea from West Valley City on Lime 1. Andrea, first time caller, how you doing? Hi, um, I wanted to ask about my grandma. Okay. She really is hurt and she used to be a Mormon and she really loves God really much and she is really, she loves him really much and we wanted to ask if she can have help. Is your, t is your TV on, Andrea? Yeah. Yeah, turn it down or you're going to listen to yourself. Yes. Have, have someone turn that down, honey. Now, now, so your grandma needs help? Yeah, and she really loves God. Where does she live? She lives with me. She lives with you? Yeah. Okay, and she was a Mormon? Yep. And she doesn't go anymore? Nope. Does she go to church anymore? Yes, she does. Where does she go? Calvary. Well, excellent. It sounds like she's doing okay. Yep. Yeah. How about you? Good. I'm happy. Well, you're, what makes you happy? My grandma. She makes me smile. She does. And do you go to Calvary with her? Yep. Well, how old are you, Andrea? 11 going on 12 in August. <laughs> 12 in August. 
Well, that's the natural order of things, isn't it? It's really good to talk to you. Thanks for calling the show, and we'll keep you and your grandma in our prayers. Okay. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, oh, excellent. All right, we have Angel from Salt Lake City, first-time caller. Angel, you're on Heart of the Matter. Oh, hi, Sean. Um, I just wanted to call and um, give you, you know, um, thank you for your program. Uh, I don't think you realize how it's changed my life personally. Um, I was born and raised in a Mormon family, and just hearing your, you know, you've been in that situation and still are around others like me and like you, and it's just hard to kind of be in Utah and be an ex-Mormon and kind of deal with the family thing, and it's just, I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> and, I'm, and I haven't seen your show in a while. It's been a few months, oh. uh, but I, I'm liking the beard. It's, it's, it's nice. <laughs> you like the beard? But I also had a question, like, how do you overcome, like, the, you know, your family's questions and, and hard things like that. Like, I don't know how to get past the questions. And You know what? In, in my family, uh, Angel, it's very difficult because they, they don't listen to me at all, and I don't, I don't offer anything to them at all. Uh, we don't talk about anything religious, and so it's just kind of off to the side. And I think that's typical. Um, is. Yeah. But when I speak with other people, the best advice I can give is to just you just be the very best Christian there is. And that means filled with love and long suffering and patience and kindness and show them by who you are. And when an opportunity opens up itself up before you to them, the Lord will tell you through his spirit and you'll know what to say. But in the interim, don't push it because um, it just doesn't seem to work. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Because yeah. I feel like at a loss sometimes. I feel like I should be, you know, sitting there telling them exactly how I feel. But in a sense, they're not going to listen until they're ready because they have their mindset to what they believe in and nothing else is right. And so I feel like, you know, exactly. I, I, there's nothing I could say at this point where they even even want to hear anything it, I have to say. Exactly. And, you know, what's interesting, I just talked to uh, a young woman who uh, used to... Um, be all over her Christian uh, nephew, or, I mean, her Christian nephew for leaving the church and becoming a Christian, all over him, all over him. And then she had a death. One of her young kids died, and she sat back and examined what was being said. And she, uh, and she came to know the Lord just by virtue of that tragedy. And she had to eat all of her words. And so it's just the Lord's timing with people. He will bring them to the point where they'll, they'll be ready to talk to you. Yeah, and I never thought I'd be Christian ever. I always, you know, until my boyfriend was like, girl, what is this about your church? And I had nothing to say. I had no clue what my church was about, but yet I would bear my testimony and say it was true. So it was right. more of like what I was taught instead of what I really, really, truly believed in my heart. Exactly. Well, praise well, God. <laughs> I'm glad we can, I can call you sister. <laughs> Thank you so much, son. All right, Angel. Take care. You too. God bless. Bye-bye. We're going to Mickey in Salt Lake City, first-time caller. Mickey, you're on Heart of the Matter. Right now? You are right now. Okay. Go ahead, Mickey, and if your TV's on, you've got to turn it down. Yep, I've got it off. Okay. You're on the air. Okay. I can hear your TV, Mickey. You've got to turn that down. Oh. <laughs> yes, um... I wanted to talk to you and tell you that we Utah needed you years ago. It's too bad that you haven't been with us before. But I wanted to tell you that um, there uh, in I I don't remember what book it's in, but when Nicodemus asked Jesus about the seven men and that and who was she she be with in heaven. He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, black nor white, male nor female, in heaven we are all one. Well, that's a, that's a, I don't remember where that is exactly in the Bible, but I love it. And uh, it sounds like, uh, are you a Christian? Yes, I am. Where do you go to church? Well, I was going over to Salt Lake Christian Center till I got too sick to get out of the house. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. And how long have you lived in Utah? Uh, all my life. I uh, was raised Mormon in southern Utah, and my grandfather was a Mormon bishop down there, but it never, ever 
just uh, it was it was just dead to me. Never did face me. Yeah, Mickey, um, you have the ear of a fairly large audience right now. You've been Latter Day Saint. You're a Christian now. You sound like you have some uh, wisdom and years behind you. What would what could you say in thirty seconds or whatever to the audience about your relationship with Jesus as a Christian? Well, I could say this. Um, my whole life changed, and, and when I first became born again, I had a spirit of, uh, that lifted me so high, I felt like I could fly. And I've tried to be a good Christian, and then uh, God took two daughters from me with cancer. Oh. I had uh, a son and three daughters, and uh, the two middle daughters had cancer. They died about a year and a half apart. And I took care of them in my own house without help. Of course, I had the nurses come once in a while and all that, and they wanted to give me help. I said, no, if this is my cross to bear, God will give me the strength to do it. And so I have just taken it from there and lived day by day. And then now I, I'm not very well, but I think whatever God has for me, I'll be able to take it. But I can't wait to see him. Well, praise God, Mickey. I can't thank you enough for that beautiful testimony. And, and uh, we are sorry for your heartache. This is a veil of tears for people who take on Christ because this world is not friendly to believers. And you, uh, you have really walked the course and run the good race. And we're just thankful that you're a viewer and, and uh, for your testimony. Thank you so much. Okay. I just, I can't remember the book that that's in, but uh, Nicodemus is talking to Jesus about those women. Yeah. And uh, that's where he says, there will be neither Jew nor Greek, black nor white, male or female. We are all one in heaven. Praise God. Thank you so much, Mickey. You bet. God bless you. Thank you, and God bless you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. I like the old people and the young people. The rest of you guys just sit there and drink your... Your Kool-Aid or whatever. I'm just kidding, just kidding. All right, let's go to Jay, uh, first time caller. Jay, you're on Heart of the Matter. <laughs> hey, uh, how are you? Hey, Jay, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, well, I, I don't I only really have a question. I uh, kind of have a comment about the situation I'm, I'm going through right now. I've been, I've been LDS for, I don't know, for about 15 years or so, and... Um, for about the past 10 years, uh, I've been put through so much to the church, and I, I really had a special love for, for everything that was taught to me as a convert. Um, and uh, just kind of, you know, make this, uh, the story short. I, I just, uh, I don't know, it sounds like, um, like the church has, uh, has appropriated itself of God, um, and that kind of give him an excuse to um, to not not really not really help or spiritually nor in other in other areas I'm, I'm just I'm just going through a lot of thinking and uh, one day I feel like probably I'm, I'm being blasphemous about my church and other days I just feel like um, perhaps it's about time to call it quits it's kind of it's Kind of ambiguous, kind of what I'm going through right now. Hey, um, Jay, uh, do you have you ever attended another church? Well, <clears throat> the problem is with uh, with my paradigm right now, and kind of again what I'm going through. I um, I'm losing my faith in the whole church thing. I yeah, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a political analyst. I have a master's degree in political analyst and political science. And um, I'm beginning to think that perhaps religion is, uh, is one of those things that was needed um, in human in, in our human history. But probably we we should uh, we should start thinking and and um, probably rationalizing and, and rethinking the whole religious uh, religion thing. You know, I mean, pro yeah. perhaps it's about time that human beings retired from the whole religion thing. Right. So I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just giving you a call because you have the opportunity for people like me you know, 
to express ourselves. Yeah, Jay, I, I really uh, think your call is timely and it's an excellent point. And I want to point out something that we were talking about earlier and that we even showed a video on. And the byproduct of Christianity, when people become uh, disillusioned with the church they're in, is they pick up and they go to a different church. They go to a different pastor with a different style. But when you belong to a church that has totalist methodologies, they use methodologies to get on you, uh, to take control of you. When you step from that, you are empty. You are crushed inside and you have nothing. And that's why these streets of this state walk with people who say religion can bite the bumper on my car and they walk from all of it. And I just want you to know, my brother, you're going to go through a process of this bewilderment through nihilism. You're going to maybe not believe in anything. But I just want you to know, I personally have been through that too. I got angry. I didn't believe in any of it. But the Lord, when I turned it to him and said, you've got to save me from this quagmire, he stepped in and changed my life radically. And he gives you hope where there is none. And I can just promise you, Jay, that it's true. I have no vested interest. I don't, it doesn't matter to me what church you go to or anything like that. But the Lord is there for you. That's why he died on the cross. So just hang on to that thought through all your meanderings and, and just seek him if you can. All right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I understand that. And, yeah. Hey, listen, can we, will you stay on the line for a minute? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, hold on. All right, Jay's on line one. We're going to Ernie in West Valley on uh, line three. I'm a little bit confused here. What's our time? Ernie, you're on Heart of the Matter. Yes. Uh, my main concern is uh, some of these scholars uh, from BYU have been ex excommunicated uh, for going against some doctrine or, or expressing their beliefs and my concern is that if Mitt Romney becomes president and somebody he wants him to or if the prophet wants him to go against a certain matter will that affect him in his judgment as far as the good of the country, or will he go according to the good of his church? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a great uh, question, and I know that, uh, you know, I would agree. The, the Mitt Romney, if he is Mormon, his allegiance is to the church first, not his country, his church. And if I'm wrong on that, someone call and tell me I'm wrong. But I believe that if he's truly a Mormon, and he says he is, his allegiance is to the prophet. Because the, the prophet dictates everything. And I think the political sway on the top of the Capitol and, and the church headquarters here in Salt Lake City will try to govern a number of things. So I think your, uh, your concerns are well warranted, Ernie. Yes, I, this is what, I mean, I, I'm sure he's a good man. Sure, I, I'm sure he is too. And I, you know, my main concern is, is I don't want to be governed by a prophet. Uh, I mean, I want him to be an independent thinker, but the Mormons don't, uh, or the people from BYU, uh, you know, they've expressed concern about people that go against certain doctrines. Yeah. And uh, they fire them. I, I can't see being got a uh, country being guided. I mean, Christians. Uh, I'm a Christian. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think, uh, it's just like with Bush. I think he's a little extreme also, but yeah. uh, that's neither here nor there. Ernie, I really appreciate your call. We are out of time, my brother. All right. Thanks for calling. Bye. Bye-bye.